Okay. So, so let us go from the first one. So here the main issue is that this fully reduced QNAL, this QH2, like where you know my cursor is. So from this one electron is transferred to cytochrome C, and the other one goes back via the cytochrome B to a fully oxidized quinone, and that becomes semi-quinone radical. Okay. So having given up both electrons and both protons, this becomes fully oxidized quinone. Then in the second cycle, one more molecule of fully reduced ubiquinol uh, you know, come, uh, binds to this and from there, the, through this ion sulfur protein, one of the electrons go to the cytochrome C. Okay, just like the first one. And the other one, via cytochrome B, these two heme, uh, returns to reducing this semiquinone produced in the first cycle back to fully reduced ubiquinol. Okay. So, so while the electron has come back, but the proton has not, you know, it is pumped out. And as a result, we take uh, protons from the matrix side to fully reduce it to QH2. So that is the reason protons are taken from here. Okay. So here both protons are gone and here again both protons are gone. And here it is not shown because this is radical and that to fully to reduce, you need to take the two protons. Uh, went through these electron transfer uh, carriers and then we saw how the electron finally goes to reduce oxygen to water. So the electron transport part we have seen and then we saw in the process the protons are being pumped across the membrane as shown in this uh, slide, you know, to the in the intermembrane space. So Today what we are going to do is we are going to focus on how this proton gradient, so the gradient being it's a high concentration uh, in, uh, in the intermembrane space and uh, low in the matrix of the mitochondria. So once more to get clarity on this, I'm going to draw the same mitochondrial cartoon uh, just for some of you who may not be so diligently following this so so if this is the outer mitochondria so you have the inner mitochondria so i'm not going to draw all the you know crystals so this space this is the inter mitochondrial space um so this is where you have positive charge and this is where you have negative charge. So uh, this post, the in the slide cartoon, the left side where the arrow points corresponds to this space. And where the arrow starts from, uh, the right side is this inner side, okay. Um, okay, so, now the end result is we have a chemical potential energy here because the chemical species, this proton, uh, it has a concentration gradient. Second, you have a charge separation as well. Therefore, you have electrical potential energy. So these two components are the energy part generated by the electron transport uh, downhill, you know, from a molecule with the lower reduction potential to a molecule with the higher reduction potential. That downhill flow of electron resulted in generating these two components of potential energies. Okay. So now when the proton returns back to the matrix, you are going to have a free energy change and that will equal this. Okay. So concentration on one side versus concentration on the other side Plus, you have to take the differential in the membrane potential, okay. So, the Z is the actual electrical charge in the case of proton. For one proton, it is just one. 
so now if you take uh, instead of natural log if you take um, uh, log to the base 10 then it would really be ph you know log to the base 10 of c2 will be uh, ph right the ph is the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration so therefore this equation will rearrange into 2.3 times rt times delta ph plus faraday's number times the membrane potential difference so this is the way we will obtain the uh, free energy change in the downward flow of the protons okay so this um, you know again brings us uh, back to the chemiosmosis so so the, this cartoon is you know more, much more clearly drawn here so this is the outer mitochondrial membrane this is the inner mitochondrial membrane where all these electron transport uh, complexes that we learnt are all present here okay and so this is that cytochrome c that uh, diffuses from this to this and ubiquinon is in, within the membrane so now as the electron flew from this to oxygen and becoming water we have these protons pumped across by these three complexes and uh, so the numbers correspond to a single molecule of NADH as I told you yesterday and when you talk about uh, a molecular oxygen which is what is normally consumed producing 2H2O then you will start with 2 NADH and the numbers will double here and now uh, to uh, and when these protons come down they actually come through this pump okay there is no other way the protons can leak across the membrane and this pump this is more like the analogy the right analogy is like a hydroelectric power project so you have a dam where the water has been uh, stored uh, prevented from free flow down the river so now you have generated potential energy now when you allow that water only through a narrow pipe the pressure is going to be very high and that high pressure uh, you know the potential energy difference from uh, upstream of the dam to the downstream is now used to turn the turbine okay because that's the only way you are allowing the water to come out and the turbine uh, when it is in a magnetic field it generates electricity exactly the same thing that happens here to the last detail of the turbine here again you are going to have a rotation um, a movement generated to produce the atp molecules that uh, we will see towards the halfway of the class today so since this involves a chemical potential like ph difference and then you have a transport process okay so to coming down gradient and that is why um, you know peter mitchell show, uh, chose this word chemiosmosis to signify that the process involves a chemical reaction as well as a transport process okay so the it, it is transported through this pump and to uh, account for both of this he used he coined this word chemiosmosis so both these energy components uh, go into ATP synthesis. And this is, um, you know, readily testable uh, by thinking about certain possibilities like prediction from this model and then testing it and then uh, we know that it works. Like for example, according to this model, the electron transport or in other words oxidation and phosphorylation both will be coupled okay so that is the only way the my the proton is going to come down so if we stop either, either one of them like for example let us say if you block this and the proton is not going to come now as the electron transport is happening and as the proton concentration difference between the two sides keep increasing you will reach an equilibrium you know as long as the proton is not going to come 
you can only build a certain concentration gradient where you will reach equilibrium between this concentration difference and the energy available from the electron flow. So as a result, the electron flow will end up stopping. So blocking phosphorylation will lead to oxidation, that is electron flow. That is one prediction and that has been observed. Okay. And um, so we see some experimental evidence here. For example, here, the oxidation or the electron flow is measured by measuring the amount of oxygen consumed. Okay. And also we measure the ATP produced for phosphorylation. So this uh, red line follows the ATP concentration and the meaning phosphorylation activity. And the black follows the oxidation activity by measuring the oxygen consumption. So when you have the substrate ADP plus uh, inorganic phosphate uh, with no electron donor, uh, you do not have anything happening to either one of the two process. Then you provide a succinate. So remember complex two. This can take a transfer electron to quinone. So you can start the electron transport at this step. And now both oxidation, the electron flow, as well as phosphorylation both happen. And now when you stop the electron flow by adding cyanide, this is why cyanide is poisonous. So I didn't get into all the different uh, inhibitors. They are all listed in tables in book and you can readily see them. They really don't need explanations. So when cyanide is added and cyanide blocks at this step, uh, you know, A to A3 in uh, uh, complex four and the electron flow therefore stops. So oxygen consumption reduces. And the important point is when you stop that electron flow or the oxidation, automatically ATP synthesis also stops. Okay, so showing that these two are coupled. And this is what you would expect by this model. So you need the electron transport to build the proton gradient and without pro proton gradient, you are not going to do phosphorylation. And that's what this experiment, uh, so that prediction is consistent with this observation. And in the next case, what we are going to do is slightly complex um, experiment. So you have added the substrate electron donor, but nothing happens unless otherwise you allow phosphorylation possible by adding ADP and inorganic phosphate. And once you have added, so like in the previous experiment when both these two are available, that is the electron donor and the substrate for phosphorylation. Now both processes start. And once you inhibit the electron transport, in this case, instead of cyanide, in this experiment, oligomycin or uh, this uh, venture edition uh, are added. So now the ATP uh, synthesis stops and the oxygen consumption that is phosphor uh, electron transport also stops. Now there are inhibitors, they are called uncouplers, okay, like this DNP. When you add, what actually they do is they allow a leakage of the protons across this membrane, okay. And when that's like short circuiting this uh, circuit. And when that, uh, when then that is allowed, now electron transport continues. Oxidation happens without any phosphorylation. Because you do not build a gradient and without the gradient, um, there is nothing to flow through the turbine to produce uh, a phosphorylation. Okay. So inhibitors of ATP synthase block electron transfer. However, there are certain agents which allow this uncoupling, then this happens. So this uncoupling does happen in nature. Like for example, in uh, brown fat adipose tissue, this is a, a lipid deposition uh, in the, the back of the neck in some of the organisms that live in uh, very cold weather. There, the process is uncoupled so that the oxidation is used to generate heat energy without synthesizing ATP so that the animal can be kept warm. So that uncoupling happens. 
so another important point that comes from uh, this is this a second point listed here so the first point i sort of already explained why does electron flow stop when adp synthesis is blocked that is because uh, the proton concentration increases to a level where now uh, the energy available from the electron transfer is only able to maintain the gradient and no more than that so it reaches an equilibrium with the electron transfer and proton pumping but the other one is if this concentration gradient only is required for adb synthesis and not actually a substrate oxidation then even without oxidation if you have this electrochemical gradient then adb synthesis should happen okay so that is written here if the role of electron transfer is to create an electrochemical potential through proton pumping then an artificial proton gradient that is without using the electron transport process if we make an artificial proton gradient through other means that also should drive atp synthesis and that has been experimentally confirmed so this is how we know chemi osmosis this is what is the best explanation for what happens in our mitochondria as well as later today we will see happening in the chloroplasts in the photosynthesis okay so this is the chemi osmotic theory of uh, oxidative phosphorylation in our mitochondria so now let us go and see what actually this is what is this pump and how does this uh, make atp so this has two subunits as you see here one is f o okay do not read it as f0 or f0 because this is not zero it is o and o stands for oligomycin sensitive so uh, this is sensitive to oligomycin so oligomycin blocks this proton flow and as a result adp synthesis will not happen so this subunit is present on the membrane so it has hydrophobic uh, residues that can interact with the hydrophobic lipid and it is uh, anchored on the membrane so this is a cross section okay so it is like a round structure and it is cut open to show the inner uh, you know tubing or lumen and then you have f1 so this is the catalytic subunit this is where atp synthase activity is located so the proton flowing through this energizes this uh, activity of f1 and details of these two are what we are going to see now so this f1 the catalytic component was first purified and shown to have the catalytic activity by ephraim racker and he did this as early as 1960s okay and an interesting experiment that he did um led to a conundrum about the way the f1 atp synthase works and that was solved only in mid 90s okay 35 years later that is because they needed to really crystallize and uh, needed a leap in our understanding you know that is where you really call genius in thinking it's not incremental process uh, to propose a model to explain how the uh adp synthesis uh, enzyme functions so that will be our primary focus for today's class so what uh, raker found was when you incubate the purified f1 with adp and uh, inorganic phosphate which is um radio uh, sorry uh, inorganic phosphate and water with radio labeled oxygen o18 water okay so very quickly what he found was that all the four oxygens of the inorganic phosphate that um, would really uh, would form if the original inorganic phosphate non radio labeled one combines the adp and forms atp and then that atp 
hydrolyzes using the oxygen from the water and this process happens multiple times then only this phosphate will end up having o18 oxygen every in all the four uh, oxygen atoms here and he saw that and that indicated this explanation that is in the active side of this enzyme this ADP plus PA forming ATP and then the ATP hydrolyzing back to ADP and inorganic phosphate must be happening very quickly and multiple times. In other words, this process must be existing in equilibrium. Okay. So that is what he found. So its catalysis of ATP synthesis from ADP and PA is readily reversible. Um, so this led to a problem. So then why would you need energy becomes an issue, okay? So, so that is explained in this uh, reaction coordinate uh, graph. So for a normal enzyme, an enzyme substrate combines, this ES complex formation is the one that requires a lot of energy. That is where all the binding energy, non-covalent interaction, everything comes, okay? On the other hand, with the ATP synthesis, this particular ATP synthesis, this mitochondrial F1 ATP synthesis, on uh, that complex formation like ES, okay, so E, S, and then E, P. So these are not having any big energy difference. It's nearly um, the equilibrium constant is one. But on the other hand, for the ATP to dissociate away from the enzyme required a lot of energy. Okay. So that is an interesting difference from this. And why is this and what is the explanation for this took a lot of time. So what eventually people found was that the enzyme's active site um, very tightly bound ATP. And that itself was enough to drive the reaction from ADP plus inorganic phosphate to ATP. But the energy was actually released, uh, required to release the ATP from the enzyme site, active site. And a mechanism for this, how this happens was proposed by Paul D. Boyer, who won Nobel Prize for that uh, in a really great discovery. So that uh, we come to it in a minute after we understand the crystal structure of the F1 ADPs. And that was solved by John Walker, 1994. Okay. So the enzyme was purified 1960. And its crystal structure became available in 94. Because it's not that solving this crystal structure took 34 years. Um, the crystallographic techniques became advanced enough to attempt these kind of complex structures um, you know, the, that process took that much time and uh, definitely this was one of the complex structures and it required a lot of um, effort to solve the structure. So this is the model of the solved structure. So where you have the subunits here, so you have an alpha subunit and beta subunit and they exist as dimers and three such heterodimers are present. And then the gamma subunit forms a rod shaped structure in the middle of the circular arrangement of these heterodimers. Okay, these are like uh, one, two, three. So you have three heterodimers arranged in a circular form, and in the middle, like a shaft, you have the gamma subunit. And this is the ball and stick model of this. And here, other subunits, there are a few more subunits and they are not shown here. And FO is also not shown. And here you can see, uh, it, you know, to beta subunit, you have the ATP here. And then here to another um, beta subunit, you have the ADP bound. So these are shown in yellow and red colors. So this is a side view, uh, like as sh shown in this model. And this one is as if you are viewing from top down, okay, in this direction. So you have these arrangements, okay. And this, uh, what is alpha empty, beta empty, all this will become clear when we go and consider the buyer's mechanism. 
So pay attention in any case to these. These two have a conformation that is different from the other two indicated by this outer line. Okay. So alpha, beta, but the conformation of uh, the three heterodimers are distinct. Each one is different from the other two. Okay. So this is sort of show indicated by in this cartoon by this round shape and this is little sharpened and this is with these sharp ends. So, so they, uh, they have distinct conformation and that becomes critical. So this is shown along with the FO subunit which is like a, a barrel shaped uh, C subunit. So there we are going to use the A, B, C like the C subunit, the 10 of them form the cylinder like structure on the membrane. And then you have the A subunit and then the B is the one that contacts this uh, F1 um, by attaching to the delta subunit, which is not shown in the structure of F1, the crystal structure of F1. And thereby it anchors this circular structure to the membrane. So this does not have any ability to rotate or move because this anchors tightly to the membrane. Okay. And uh, uh, what uh, Paul Boyer proposed, uh, let me show his picture yeah, here. So he died, uh, few, uh, I think three years ago, or I think three years ago, or maybe two years ago, very recently he passed away. He is one of the pioneering biochemists. He edited methods in enzymology, several volumes of that book. So he proposed a model whereby as the yellow protons flow through this um, cylinder, that is the FO's uh, C subunits, that starts to rotate. And to that, via this epsilon subunit, the gamma subunit of the, the shaft of F1 is attached. And due to that, along with the cylinder, the shaft also rotates. And the shaft rotating, so this has specific contacts to the beta subunit. And as it rotates, it sequentially changes the conformation of the three beta subunits. Okay, so that is his um, proposal. <coughs> this is called a rotational catalysis. Okay, and that rotation cartooned here. So where you have uh, this interacting with a particular beta subunit, it, 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 this uh, now undergoes a conformation change that releases the ATP out. And the interactions among them are such that when the gamma subunits interact with a given beta subunit, changing its conformation to empty, meaning there is no ADP or ATP bound. That is why it is called beta empty, alpha empty. And when it does that, adjacent to one, one of them, conformation changes such that it binds ADP and inorganic phosphate. And since this readily becomes ATP from Ephraim Racker's experiment we know, then this changes conformation to this one. Okay. And when it again rotates, then uh, as shown here, the next one becomes uh, empty. The ATP gets released. And when it rotates to the next one, that also releases. So when this gamma subunit finishes one 360 degree rotation, each subunit have catalyzed the formation of an ATP and released it out as well. Okay. So the phosphorylation readily happens and the energy required is only to drive the conformation to the empty conformation where the ATP is thrown away. Okay. And that is what happens. So that is shown in this um, animation of uh, which I'll see whether I can play this. Okay, it doesn't play. 
So essentially what is going to have, see is this black arrow is the gamma subunit. So when it interacts with one given beta subunit, the ATP is released and then now um, the, that is uh, ready to bind ADP and PA. And that is what has happened here. And uh, when it shifts to this, then this is going to become now the beta MT. And this will be the ADP binding one. And then ATP have forms and when it comes again, that is going to release. So this needle-like structure, you will see it rotating in jerky motion, okay? Every motion is 120 degrees. So the 360 is equally divided into three parts for the interaction from shifting from one beta to another beta to another beta. So it is not like a smooth rotation. Instead, it goes in steps. It's a three-step uh, rotation. And that is what happens. This is what uh, Paul Boyer proposed. And this was confirmed later by really elegant experiments um, that um, you know, this is Yoshida and Kinosita uh, devised. So what these people actually devised is they made transgenic um, proteins, alpha, beta, with the histidine residues and the histidines, because of their negative charge, can bind to a glass slide. This is microscope slide coated with the nickel. So this is anchored now to the glass slide. And you have the gamma subunit uh, connecting to this um, cylinder C of this FO. And to that, they have added biotin, this uh, red circle here. And to that, they add a long acting filament with abidin attached to it. And due to the abidin biotin affinity, this is now in interacting with this. So now you, when you add uh, ATP and when this hydrolyzes it, so you have reverse rotation uh, compared to the ATP synthesis. And that also would be predicted by Boyer's model and that's exactly what happens. So now as it rotates, they had a fluorochrome attached to acting. So using a fluorescence microscope and time-lapse video, they were able to um, monitor the fluorescence shifting in a circular fashion and they could see that it shifted in 120 degree at that time. And that is how they were able to observe how this happens. Okay. And here, the energy available from the proton gradient and the energy required for the rotation is nearly perfectly matched such that the machine, this motor is, uh, you know, at the theoretical maximum of energy efficiency in converting the um, proton gradient potential energy available in making this uh, motion. And that is what made Boyer to call this as a splendid machine. So this is the amazing thing about an enzyme catalysis where you have rotation of a turbine-like motion uh, leading to the catalysis of ADP to ADP synthesis. So the main point is the energy required here is not for the reaction itself, but it is actually to release the product from the enzyme active site. So I hope this is clear. So with this, we are actually finishing our oxidative phosphorylation. So we saw electron transfer, that is oxidation, cost proton gradient, and also a charge separation. And when that potential uh, energy difference is allowed to uh, dissipate via a turbine, that is the F1 ATP synthase linked to this um, FO membrane bound uh, actual turbine, we end up making the phosphorylation reaction. That is ADP plus inorganic phosphate becoming ATP. So this completes uh, our understanding of starting from glucose, how we get energy in the form of ATP molecules. And we know how why ATP is high energy molecule. 
and we also know how the carbohydrate molecule has been oxidized to carbon dioxide and um, in the same process oxygen being reduced to water so carbon dioxide and water goes in in the photosynthesis and uh, carbon assimilation reaction that we are going to see next and then finally it all comes back to carbon dioxide and water through the oxidative phosphorylation so we have actually traveled with the electrons all the way from glucose to uh, oxygen becoming water so this completes one sequence of events and through the process of this we have understood uh, quite a few of the central concepts of biochemistry including catalysis bioenergetics regulation uh, um you know many aspects of enzyme mechanisms and so on so next we switch gears to considering a proton gradient formation where energy is actually input in the form of sun's light energy okay here energy is released through the process because we have electrons falling from up to a down level that is from lower reduction potential to higher reduction potential and therefore energy is available now what we are going to do is we are going to provide energy and force electrons to flow through to make the proton gradient again okay so that is what is photosynthesis so before we get into those details let us have a global uh, picture of um, you know matter uh, cycling among the biological systems that is between photosynthetic organisms and heterotrophs like us so that part we will look at in this slide so this is extremely simple you probably learnt in uh, high school but uh, probably did not look at it from a philosophical angle so that is what i want you to do here so the sun's energy drives the photosynthetic cells to combine oxygen carbon dioxide and water to produce carbohydrates and evolve oxygen in the process okay so carbohydrate you have the three elements required it's, it's amazingly simple only three elements that we put together to make life happen so the energy production liberation and most of the storage all are involving only these three elements extremely simple system um so photosynthetic cells put these together to make this and we just saw the heterotrophs come consume these and return these back so therefore in living system by the action of sun's energy this is the sole source of energy okay um if you are burning fossil fuel fossil fuel is carbohydrate made millions of years ago or thousands of years ago and that was made by photosynthetic cells so sun's energy is the only source of energy in the biosphere in the biological systems for the uh, carbon hydrogen oxygen cycling uh, that is shown here this cycling is made possible by the energy from sun and sun alone so the equation above summarizes the process so the energy of light co2 plus h2o gives you ch2o plus o2 so now let's uh, get into some of the details uh, you know in the next few minutes of time we have so this slide summarizes the general features um, like when you have light through light reactions because it's light dependent so we call them light reactions water is split and electrons are taken up so oxygen is returned so the water is here oxidized just now in the previous one we saw the opposite so here this is one process second you have these oxidized coenzymes like nad your photo system uses the phosphorylated version of nad so nadp otherwise here also the electron transfer is in the hydride form gets reduced to nadph so oxygen is evolved and reducing equivalence are produced 
and the third is ATP formation as well. Okay, so these are the things the light reaction produce. And uh, carbon assimilation reactions, do not call them dark reactions because they can happen even in the presence of light. It is just that these reactions are not dependent on light. So therefore, the correct way of calling them is carbon assimilation reaction because it assimilates carbon dioxide. So by using the reducing E coulombs and the energy in ATP, these reactions reduce carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. So therefore, you have two components, one light reaction producing ATP and the reducing E coulombs. Okay, oxygen evolution is incidental in terms of our energy here. And these two are used to convert carbon dioxide to carbohydrate. So essentially, whatever is the end product of TCA cycle, you know, decarboxylations we saw producing carbon dioxide. And here now we take the carbon dioxide and make carbohydrate. So these are the two major components of the photophosphorylation reaction. So two points I want to draw your attention to. One is in the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, the, the electron donor is NADH. Okay. So that is a very willing donor of electrons compared to the molecule that is going to donate here, which is uh, water. So, so therefore, to get electrons out of water, you really need energy. So that is one important difference here. And that energy is what is coming from sun. So how is that energy used, okay, abstracted to do this work is one important thing we are going to see. And the second is that you need, uh, the, the, which I just mentioned as first part of it itself. The first part, therefore, is just that NADH is not, NADH is a, a good electron donor and water is not. So, and water is the electron donor here in the light reaction. And the second, as a result of that, you need energy input. So, photophosphorylation in, uh, differs in that respect from the oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation did not require energy input. We did not hydrolyze any ATP to move the electrons from one complex to another complex. Whereas here energy will be required okay, to uh, generate good electron donor as well as good electron acceptor. To do that, you need energy input. So these are the two main differences we need to keep in mind. So I'll stop here with this uh, you know, bird's eye view of photophosphorylation and we'll get into the details tomorrow. So the first thing is we are going to look at how is light energy taken up um, to really uh, generate a good electron donor and, uh, and a good electron acceptor if possible that we may not be able to finish tomorrow. So that is where we are going to focus tomorrow. 